So let's get started. Thanks again for tuning in. My name is Eric Elliott, and I'm the Advanced Hunter Education Coordinator with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And let me introduce my, our topic and presenter tonight. So if you're anything like me, even though it's the off season, you are still thinking about what you're gonna be doing in 2024 and how you can be, be better prepared for your hunts. This whole webinar series is designed to jumpstart your hunting preparation. We're gonna be doing a series on rifle scopes. Tonight is part one of a three-part series on rifle scopes. Tonight, we're gonna be talking how to buy, best buy a scope. And then part two is gonna be about how to mount a scope. And then part three, we're gonna conclude the series on how to sight in a scope rifle. I'm thankful to have with me tonight, Rick Tagawa as a presenter. Rick is an NRA training counselor for rifle, shotgun, and pistol. He's also an NRA shotgun coach. He's a coach for National Sporting Clay Association and, and is also a competitive shooter. But in my opinion, your best part of your bio, Rick, is that you're a certified hunter education instructor with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thanks so much for volunteering your time. Thanks so much time for your willingness to be on this webinar tonight. So let's get rolling. Take it away, Rick. Thank you guys again from my side for join you guys joining. One of my suggestions that I have for all the audience is to take out your cell phone. Because there's going to be things that I want you to take pictures of, of the PowerPoints. And um, it'll help you kind of have a, a memory like uh, I, I have a scope uh, diagram. And I actually have a copy of it sitting in front of me. And that's one of the slides I want you to take a picture of. So if you can grab your, grab your cell phones and take pictures, that would be great. Uh, it'll, it's easier than taking notes in my mind. So it was just a suggestion. And let's see if we can get rolling here. So we're going to talk tonight about buying a rifle scope. Um, I think in the last probably 10 or 15 years, the rifle scope technology and nomenclature and what people prefer has dramatically changed in the last 10 years. Um, and so, and part of that's been driven by the, uh, the, the need, people wanting need to shoot long distance. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to start there that this is some of the stuff will be foreign to some people that are older that have been shooting a long time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've had the web for about 25 years or 30 years now. And uh, this is my thought on, on the internet. There's a ton of information on the internet, but not a lot of wisdom. Because you have to take the information you get. So there's a lot of wankers on the uh, on the internet about about gun stuff and you have to kind of look and see, and really look at it with a with a tainted eye that they're probably not right and start from there so that's where i'm going to start with uh, cuz you there's a lot of stuff on mounting scopes and i've seen some of it and i went whoa that's about right so anyway here's one i want you to take a picture of um it's uh it's the elevation turret the windage turn all these all these parts of a scope we're going to talk about tonight and if you take a picture of this then you'll have the ability to reflect on it or kind of look or zoom in it to just to give yourself because you're not going to memorize it just looking at it so i'll give people a few seconds to uh to take a picture of it and uh we'll get rolling through this so rick while people are taking a picture give me a quick uh explanation on like for example this elevation turret what does that do what is the what does elevation on the scope do well there's uh, there's up and down and right and left i guess is the best way you put it yeah. and elevation is up and down and windage is right and left Got so it. It, moves, okay. it moves the point of impact of the of the crosshairs in the scope to a different place and so that excellent that'll be it that'll be a place to start all right i think everybody should have some of this at least most of this are picture so let's move on so what things do you look at on a scope and how does it how has it changed in the past and and uh 
uh, what parts are met, what what parts and what how uh, lenses work, what is important to you with a scope. So let's talk about lens coatings and quality of lenses. That's a that's a, probably the place that most people know the least about. So I'll talk about things that happen with scopes that are that the cheaper the scope is, probably the biggest bigger problems you're going to have in any of these in any of these these uh, subject matters. The more expensive scopes have less less problems, but it's a matter of where you put yourself. Um. So a chromatic aberration, if you've ever seen where the center of a the center of a lens or binoculars, a scope, uh, a telescope this, or a microscope even, the center is perfectly clear, but all the edges are out of focus. That's chromatic aberration that the that the uh, the lenses tend to be they're called planar and non-planar. Planar is a where everything across the, the view of the scope, is crystal clear. A uh, non-planar scope is one that there's a halo of bad focus around the edge because of chromatic, because of lens quality. And the bigger the lenses you have, the more you're going to have chromatic aberrations just by the nature of the beast of light and 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 bending light that scopes do. So that's one one thing you look for in a quality of scope is chromatic aberration. Um, next thing is color shift. They do put coatings on these lenses to create a particular color. And some scopes, the cheaper scopes are not as good at doing color correction because your, your color changes um, uh, as you coat the lenses. So the better quality scopes have pure, pure correct colors. Uh, the reds are reds, the greens are greens, the, they're not shifted to blue or the reds are not shifted to purple because of the, hit in the lenses and the coatings. So color shift is another thing you have to look at that red may not be red in your scope if it's an inexpensive scope or as red. Uh, depth of field is another one. To understand depth of field, if you've ever seen a picture of like a butterfly or a, um, or a flower that's done very close up and the flower or the, or the butterfly is in perfect image, but everything behind it is blurred. That is a lack of depth of field. If you have a, um, but if you have all of it clear from the from the butterfly all the way to the ground, the flower around it, everything in the picture is perfectly clear. That is a deep depth of field. Now, another one, one of the thing, one of the negatives to having a larger uh, objective lens, and you'll find out why why objective lenses larger or smaller is why you buy them. <laughs> the larger objective lenses have left less depth of field. The power magnification, um, this is one of the ones that I think, uh, this is my opinion, most people overbuy their scopes. And they buy them primarily because of magnification. Magnification on a scope is based on a multiple of the original magnification. So let's say the bottom magnification on a scope is three times the normal image of one, you know, it magnifies three times. Well, if it's a four times, uh, a magnification system, then four times three is 12. So your maximum will be 12. Some of them are five times up to, I think it's up to seven or eight times now a magnification. So you can get, I think the one of the scopes I was looking at today had a six bottom end magnification, but a top end of 36. So that's a six times magnification. So the magnification is how big your picture is and too many people over buy magnification most hunting magnification probably the most you will ever need in a hunting scenario is a 14 times scope or a 12 times scope too many people buy 20 and 30 in fact most people don't know that long range shooters that shooting out 1000 1500 yards most of the time the maximum magnification they use on their scopes even though they can go up to 30 or 40 times they'll only use 15 to 20 at the max because it, it's hard to hold on a target with that much magnification. So ma the magnification you buy is important. So you just have to know that that uh, it's a time something and uh, and uh, your maximum magnification will give you your bottom end magnification if you know the, 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 the multiple. 
this is something that I, I had been hunting all my life and never knew this up until probably four years ago, I guess. Um, there is a first plane, first plane or second plane scopes. And this, this is where they put the crosshairs in the scope before if if you if you put it back in the back, I think it's a first focal plane. You put it on the front second focal plane. A first focal plane, or set, let's do a second focal plane because that's what most people are are. Second focal planes were. I I didn't see a first focal plane until maybe ten years ago, but uh, the, so most scopes are second focal plane that most people know and see, and a second focal plane. You may be changing the magnification on the scope, but the crosshairs never change in size. And if those crosshairs have marks in it, let's say it's an uh, MOA mark, and that one mark is one MOA, you'll find out what MOA is in, in a second. But they're markers for for uh, for actually measurement when you're looking through the scope. And the only time on a second focal plane, the only time the measurements are correct are genuine when it's at full magnification. A first focal plane scope, it, uh, when you change the magnification of the scope, you make it bigger or smaller, the crosshairs actually change in size too. And those markings are good at any magnification. If you're, But me personally, for hunting, buy a second focal plane scope. Second focal plane scopes are cheaper, but first focal plane scopes for long distance shooting them where they're trying to measure measure how much they want to move for wind or how much they want to move for elevation and it's marked in their scope it has to be correct the problem with first focal plane scopes at most hunting magnifications which if you're shooting at 100 yards you're probably going to shoot it at six power um most of them the 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 uh crosshairs are so small especially in the dusk or in dawn when there's not a lot of light you can't see them that's why i use second focal plane scope for hunting. Let's watch a little video that I have here that uh, um, that explains first focal plane versus second focal plane and so you can visually see it because this is important. This is some of the stuff that's new in the, in the optics. Bit. The target's image would increase and decrease when you change the magnification setting, but the reticle would stay the same size. A second focal plane scope, the reticle stays the same, where the target's image gets bigger and smaller with adjustment changes. Now contrast that to a first focal plane scope. And even though it has the word first in it, it actually is more popular now. It was not what scopes used to be. That's the newer version. First focal plane scopes, the reticle and the target image get bigger and smaller together. So that means when you power down all the way, the reticle gets really tiny with the tiny target image. Or if you zoom all the way in, the reticle gets really big with the big target image. Now that is really handy if you're using adjustments on that reticle to make measurements on the target or if you're using certain wind or elevation holds because those adjustments are accurate at any magnification setting. Whereas with the older second focal plane scopes, like I learned on, I had a mill dot scope in the military where they had these little dots on the scope that measured out as one mil each. If you're curious about what mills and minutes and all those things are, we've got other videos for you there. But that mill would only equal one actual mill measurement if the scope was on its maximum setting because it was a second focal plane scope. And when I made the adjustments, the target would change and the reticle wouldn't. Whereas the first focal plane at any magnification setting, it's always one mill because they change size together. So why should you get one over the other? Well, if you're looking to save some money and you want a quality scope, you can get a second focal plane scope because they're usually less expensive, all else being equal than a first focal plane scope. And if you're not doing target shooting where it's absolutely necessary that the reticle and the target image are exactly the same size, that might be a good spot to save some of your budget. But when you're hunting, I prefer a second focal plane scope. It's not as fancy doesn't have as many features, I get it. But the reason I like it is I'm often shooting at low magnification settings when I'm hunting, or I'm shooting in low light scenarios. On a first focal plane scope, where that reticle gets really tiny when I'm zoomed all the way out, that's really hard to see sometimes, especially in low light situations. Where that second focal plane scope, I have that crisp, clear, big reticle, 
even though the target's image might be smaller. So think about your application and decide on whether having one difference or the other is really worth it or not. Target shooting, where you need to have precise measurements at every focal range, go ahead and splurge on the first focal plane scope. But if you're hunting, or maybe that feature is not as important to you, just remember that the measurements are only going to work at one magnification setting and save some money on that second focal plane scope. That's anybody have any questions right now? Because that's we've covered a lot of material. Anybody, uh, anybody want to put in the chat some questions? You want to look at that, Eric? See if there we got anything down there that's valuable. Yeah, looking. To so, kind of bottom line that for us, your is the recommendation a, a first focal plane then Rick for hunting scenarios. Second focal plane is my recommendation for okay. most, most hunters. I have hunting rifles with first focal planes on it, but they have illuminated reticles so I can see them at dark and in low light conditions. Yeah. So you, it, it, if you're going to use it for long distance and you use it for hunting, long distance first focal planes is the, 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 now, now the standard. But for hunting situations, for most hunters, they're not going to use your you know, you're a six feet creed more for super long distance shooting, not over a thousand yards. Don't worry about it. Okay. So that's where I'm at. Second focal point for most hunters is more than adequate. In What's fact, like I said my own, my own personal hunting rifle has a second focal plane on it. Is there a pretty significant price differential between first and second focal plane, Rick? Yeah, you can get, you know, some scopes. I'll make a recommendation down the line, but you know, some scopes down in the $200 price range, they're all going to be second focal plane. You can get first focal plane starting about $500 going on maybe $1,000 second first focal plane start because they're expensive. So and most for most hunting situations, you don't use all that stuff. So don't overbuy your scopes. That's That's just my rule. Most people overbuy their scopes. What other variables affect a rifle scope? Objective lens size. Here's two rifle scopes. I don't know if you can see them, but you can see the. Uh, this is the objective lens. The back, the the downrange part of the lens. If you can see, they're pretty different in size. And this rifle scope, the the small lens rifle scope, probably weighs a pound, uh, maybe a half a pound, maybe three quarters of a pound. The the large lens rifle scope weighs probably thirty ounces. Over to over two pounds. So, but the reason that you have those big lenses is light gathering. If you're in low light conditions or you need light gathering, bigger lens. If it's heavy magnification, bigger lens. Um, but again, with a bigger lens, you get less depth of field and more chromatic aberration. Your lenses aren't as perfectly clear all the way across the, the field of vision. So that's something you have to remember unless you buy high-end scopes, you're going to have problems with some something's and you buy those big lenses, something is going to give there. Okay. Everybody thinks that one of the misnomers that I've seen online is that tube diameter creates more light. And that's not true or more light gathering. That's not true. The only thing a larger tube does is it gives you more windage and elevation. So the, the most common tube sizes you'll find are one inch, 30 millimeter, 34 millimeter. There are some bigger ones, but the only thing that that does is if you're going to shoot out a thousand yards, you need a big tube to have that much dial in your windage to be able to lob a bullet that far. But these tubes are heavy. The one I showed you is the 34 millimeter tube. That sucker weighs a ton. In fact, one of my 22s I just bought, I had an option to buy a 34 or 30 millimeter, and it was seven ounces difference in weight on a 22. I said, I'm not buying the 34. I bought the 30. So the weight matters. I don't think I'm going to use that much elevation. I think it was a difference of about six, four or five mil in elevation range. And I said, that's ah, not worth it. So we've been talking a little about, a bit about minutes of angle and mil radians. The, there are two different measurement systems inside of scopes. Take, and we're going to watch it down the road. We're going to have a video about this, but minute of angle, take that as standard measurements, inches, feet, miles, yards. 
take that as that. Mill radian is like metric system, millimeters, centimeters, uh, kilometers, and, and, and millikilometers. So they're just they're two separate systems that one is not better than the other. One uh, for certain things, one has an advantage over the other, but either one's good. For most hunting scopes, MOA is fine. And it, because the, the push now is to go to mill radians. The only reason you use mill radians for any or have to buy mill radian scope is for uh, long distance shooting. That's why there's a big push on on uh and hunting i hope you're for most hunters i hope you're not you're not going to take a shot more than 300 yards anyway so for most of you you're never going to dial your scope to change the elevation because you're going to shoot out at 500 yards most of you are not going to do that we'll talk about that later on how you set up your scope but don't think that one is better than the other just because mill is more popular doesn't mean it's better I think MOA is fine for hunting and most more inexpensive scopes under four or $500, they're going to be MOA. It's commonly to find them MOA. Uh, you don't find mill in the, in the real inexpensive scope. So don't feel bad if you, if you want, if you buy an MOA scope, it's not a bad thing. It's just a different style of measurement. That's not as popular today. Let's talk real quick. You just mentioned four or 500 bucks. Rick, is that ballpark of can you get a decent scope for four or five hundred bucks, or what would you? Oh, you can get awesome scopes for four or five hundred bucks, but again, uh, the the issue the issue that you get is that I I, I put it, it's in my presentation, but I wouldn't spend less than two hundred bucks on a scope for hunting. Mm. You can get them down to hundred. You can get them below hundred, but they're not going to. I don't think they're going to be quality enough that you can depend on them. They're, they're, the optics are poor. Uh, the the adjustments, the clicks in the the clicks in the in the system. This the elevation and, and each individual click is supposed to mean something in measurements down the line. And the cheaper scopes, they aren't. They don't connect to the what they say they're going to connect to. If it's one MOA or quarter MOA per click, it's not exactly quarter MOA per, per click on a cheap scope. And when you start seeing how to side in. That matters. So, you know, um, right. so that's that's my that's my that's my take on it. Is that yeah? You they the guys the old, old dudes used to say that uh, when you buy a when you buy a scope, you're supposed to buy a scope just as expensive as the rifle you bought. But that's an old one. Today, that's not true. You can buy cheaper scopes. If you buy a fifteen hundred dollar rifle, you don't have to spend fifteen hundred dollars on a scope. Or if you buy a $600 rifle, you don't need to spend $600 on a scope. I think scopes have gotten lower in price over the years. Mm. All they give you. Interesting. So anyway, parallax adjustment. That's another one. Most people don't know much about parallax adjustment. And I think I want to do the, I think I want to pull this YouTube up to show you guys. All right. Now, some of you might be looking at rifle scopes and you'll notice that maybe it has an adjustable objective or this thing called a side parallax adjustment. Now, first off, it's important to note that actually both of these features do the exact same thing, which is correcting parallax error. They're just two different locations for having that different adjustment on the rifle scope. Now, Generally speaking, a side focus parallax is easier to get to for a shooter. It's a little bit more involved manufacturing process. So you might see that on a slightly more expensive scope. But again, that doesn't mean that it's doing anything better than a scope with an adjustable objective. They're actually doing the same thing, just a bit more convenient for the shooter. So anyway, parallax, uh, parallax error, what exactly is that? Well, to best explain it, let's consider the fact that when we're shooting, we're kind of dealing with three different planes. And uh, the first would be our eye. The second is inside of our rifle scope and where we're using for our point of aim. And the third is then our target that we're aiming at. Now we can kind of make this with just our fingers and our eye where we have, uh, let's say this is our rifle scope, one finger, and then the next is our target. 
Well, right now we have them spread apart. So they're on different planes, kind of like we refer to here. And when they're on different planes and they're spread apart, if we get our eye directly in line with them, they can look like they're exactly on top of each other. Now, this is just like if you're looking through your rifle scope, if you have a perfect cheek weld and your eye is directly in line with the rifle scope and its optical system, you can have it look as though this theoretical is right on top of the target and there won't be any error there. Where the parallax error starts to come into play is then as your head and your eye starts to move off axis a little bit. Maybe you don't have a perfect cheek weld. You're a little bit over to one side or up or down. It could be just about anything. But what starts to happen is, again, now we have our fingers out in front of us and we have our rifle scope and we have our uh, image out here that we're looking at. As we start to move our head around, you'll notice that even though our fingers aren't physically moving, it appears as though they're moving in relation to one another. So again, let's say we have a rifle scope that either can't account for parallax error, it doesn't have a side adjustable knob, or it doesn't have an adjustable objective. If it can't do that, then if you come and you don't have a perfect cheek weld, you might start shooting off of an error where really your reticle is actually on top of a target, for example. But if you're over here, you might feel as though it's off to the side. And so you'll make the adjustment and the correction by moving your whole rifle, but you're actually doing that based on an error. So you might notice that you're actually missing the target left, right, up, or down. And actually what's happening is it's just parallax error. Now, when we account for parallax error, what essentially we're doing is we're moving the target and the, uh, and the plane inside of our rifle scope as our point of aim onto the same plane. And so again, we can demonstrate that with our fingers here because what we're essentially doing is moving both of those to being right on top of one another. So now if our fingers are on top of one another and our head is right here, it still looks like they're covering one each other up. But as we move our head around, up, down, left, right, well, actually, they always look like they're on top of each other. So we don't get any of that parallax error, which is essentially making our fingers or, in this case, of course, our point of aim and our target look like they're moving in relation to one another. In the uh, case of shooting, it just means that you don't have to make such a conscious effort about having a perfect cheek weld every single time. If you're a little bit off, you can still know that where your reticle looks to be in your rifle scope in relation to that target is perfectly on target and you don't have to worry about any parallax error. Now, is it absolutely necessary to be precise and shoot long range? No, it's not absolutely necessary. Again, as long as you have a really good solid cheek weld and your face and your eye is nicely in line with that optical system, you can shoot out long range all day and not have any issues at all with parallax. And you could do that just, just fine with a rifle scope that doesn't account for parallax error. Is it a nice thing to have? Certainly it is. It makes it just one less thing for you to have to worry about when you're actually getting into position to shoot. If you have that parallax adjustment dialed perfectly to the distance that you're shooting at or very close, you don't have to worry so much about potential parallax error if your cheek weld is slightly off. So hopefully this helps. If you have any other questions, because this can sometimes be complicated stuff, please feel free to give us a call, shoot us an email. <clears throat> Did that help? Did everybody understand parallax error now that some scopes have no adjustments for parallax uh, to change the parallax in the scope, but they're set up at a fixed parallax distance. Like a 22 scope is generally set up at 50, 50 yards per parallax. Whereas some of the scopes have it like this one, have a parallax adjustment that you can change the, how the parallax acts. And you, and uh, the problem is, is do not trust the numbers on the scopes. You have to kind of, set the number on the scope and kind of test it to make sure the parallax isn't bad at that one because the numbers aren't always accurate on every scope. Um, Real quick, Rick, I've uh, got yeah. a question about cheek weld. What is, a, what is a good cheek weld? A good cheek weld is being able to put your face on the stock exactly the same place every time. So consistency. It's consistency of where, how you place your cheek on the stock every time. And you know what? Most of us can't do it. <laughs> Got it. The, to get to, to lack, he's correct. You don't need parallax adjustment for, for, for if, you're, if your cheek well is perfect, most of our cheek wells aren't perfect. That's just my take. So I use the parallax quite a bit. Um, in fact, there's a one scope manufacturer I love because if your parallax isn't right, it's out of focus which is perfect because if it if it's in focus the parallax is perfect <laughs> the the parallax adjustment actually does focus too it's pretty cool um zero stop 
zero stop is the long distance shooters. You'll hear long distance. I just want to talk about it. This is not a long distance shooting class, but I want to talk a little bit about zero stop because you'll hear the terminology and I want you to know what it is. On a scope, when these guys are dialing long distance, they're taking their elevation and cranking it, you know, maybe two turns almost, and they don't know where they are. If they want to find out where they're there, they just lower it and the scope stops at at where the where the bullet is at zero to 100 yards. So you can set that zero stop on your on some scope on a more expensive long distance scope. You can set the zero stop so you can turn it to the turn it clockwise and it will always or uh, you can turn it clockwise and eventually it'll stop. You know that's the zero to 100 yards. So and you can you 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 set that by setting your turret that way. So just so you know, um, reticle design, we'll talk a little bit later about reticle design when we start doing the siding in and stuff, but you will have options for reticle design and um, and on more expensive scope, the more options you have, but and more inexpensive scope, the less options you have, but a straight crosshair reticle design is, is never a bad thing. Uh, I, for hunting, I personally don't like a dot as a reticle, just a spec in the scope because you don't know have any idea whether you, whether your rifle's balanced or not it could be sideways and you wouldn't know it with just a dot illumination i talked a little about illumination earlier illumination is scope the the crosshairs light up some people like them some people don't like them and the reason people like them is that in low light situations you can absolutely for sure see the crosshairs because otherwise they're black lines Illumination, they'll turn green or red so you can see them in dark light conditions. But some don't like it because they can be, when you turn them on, you have to understand what power that, because they've got intensity of the light. And if you turn the light on too high, they bleed and you can't even see the, you can't even see the crosshairs because the whole scope virtually turns red, which doesn't help either. So illumination, you know, if you don't like it, if you got a scope that has it, that you buy a scope and it has it, just take the batteries out if you don't like it, the battery out if you don't like it. But I, I personally like it because when, in low light situations, it really helps me. But I always know that I start on one. Some people turn the dial the wrong way and they start on 10 or 11 and it's like so bright it just turns red. So, you know, you just have to understand what you're doing. All right, let me interrupt you a little bit, Rick. We yeah. A question came in on a about a trimmer reticle for long distance shooting. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, it, there's 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 probably two dozen different reticles out there. The most common for long distance shooting is called a horse reticle. Um, there's there's the, the reticle choice is 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 like how do you comb your hair? <laughs> you know, it, you know, it, it, reticle choice is a personal preference. Long, I will tell you right now, long distance reticles generally are not good for hunting. It's too much on the screen. Uh, the, 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 I would say 30% of the screen is covered with digits. Mm -hmm. If that's what you want for hunting, fine. But I got to tell you, for my, my personal hunting rifle, my MOA, my MOA scope has a crosshair and, and MOA dots in it. And that's mm -hmm. it. I, I, hunting, I don't want anything. Yet I have hunting. I have hunted with my long distance rifle, and I have all the all the all the digits, and numbers, and slashes in there. And it doesn't bother me because I'm used to it. But if you're only going to hunt with it, don't buy the fancy reticles. Makes sense. Okay, and then how about? Uh... Going back a couple slides, you were talking MOA, MOA versus MI versus no. MIL. And I think you kind of addressed this, but in your opinion, which is better? I think you were saying it's just kind of a preference thing, right? Hunt, hunting, you can use either one. It, most cheaper scopes are MOA, and it doesn't matter. It's like, is your car, does your car spot on or say, um kilometers or do your car saw if you buy a european vehicle or a japanese vehicle does it say kilometers on it or does it say miles per hour yeah does it matter well if you're in the united states and, you, and you're driving a car with kilometers you better know what that 100 kilometers is 62 miles an hour but if you're 
driving in the U.S., most of us has mile per hour. So if you have mile per hour and it says 35 miles an hour, don't go faster than 35 miles, miles an hour if you don't want to break the law. So that's that's kind of the that's the best comparison I can think of is is, is that is that car car yeah. good analogy. So all the stuff we talked about, most of them will come in a package. In other words, you can't pick and choose that I want no parallax adjustment if this particular scope model you want has parallax adjustment or it doesn't have parallax adjustment. You want parallax adjustment, you gotta buy another scope. It, it, they're packages. So they're features and packages that scopes will have. Um, so you, you got to just kind of pick and choose through the, that's the problem with scopes is you got to kind of pick and choose through all these features and stuff, what's important to me. And the more expensive scopes will give you more choices. That's all there is to it. Yeah. And uh, and so it's, it is it is difficult to buy scopes today because of the the prevalence of long distance shooting in 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 the in the rifle world right now um that's just just the way it is it's, it's so popular it's mind-blowing but it, it, there's still stuff out there you just have to make your choices that's all okay this is my take on how to buy a hunting scope highest power need is 14 times you need light gathering because you're going to be hunting at dusk and you're going to have you hunting at dawn. So larger, the better. Tube diameter, man, eh, one inch. I, my, my hunting scope is a one inch scope. I don't care because I'm never going to, I'm never going to change the turrets on that scope when I'm hunting. Uh, illumination can be important. I like illumination. My hunting scope doesn't have illumination because it's an older scope. Uh, and I would buy MOA. Because most cheaper scopes come in M Y and it doesn't really matter whether you have MRI or mill. Uh, that's so. I'm going to stop here and make sure there's no questions here. Yeah, we do have a few questions, All and right. so somebody asked about if you could talk about BDC type tele type scopes. It sounds like that's what this person has. Are you familiar with BDC? Yeah, full well, compensation. Yeah. Okay. Tell us that's about a, those. The, you, BDC is is basically, and again, in hunting, unless you're going to shoot over 300 yards, you don't care what the BDC is, because your trajectory between your, if you put a tube on the end of your rifle, it's four inches around. Will that bullet hit in that four inch tube? 50 yards, 100 yards, 200 yards, maybe 300 yards. If you put your crosshairs right on it, you'll probably hit it, something inside of that four inch tube, which is a kill zone. Yeah. So BDC doesn't matter. BDC is primarily for long distance shooters. Right. And most long distance shooters know exactly what they're going to dial their scope to, into at 600 yards. 700 yards, 1,000, 1,500 yards. They know they're just going to turn the dial. They're not even going to look at the BDC. Where they use BDC is they use it for wind change. So if they see a bullet strike off of a, off of a, they're shooting steel plates generally. If they see a bullet strike off of a steel plate and they see that it's one mil off, they're going to hold one mil the opposite direction, but they're going to use their grids and their scope for that. That's where the BDC, where long distance shooters are using BDC is in windage primarily most of the time they'll dial their elevation so if you're going to you think you're going to use bdc in hunting i don't think you need it unless you're going to go past 300 yards i don't know if that's an ethical ethical shot for most of us because we don't practice past 300 yards in fact there's only about four ranges in southern california that can shoot more than 400 300 yards mm -hmm. so i don't think that's ethical it's good wisdom there especially considering all the the big long range movement. And I've seen that, that in enforcement throughout my game warden career. Um, uh, there's a lot of people that have long range rifles. And when you start talking with them about how much they've actually used them and, and how much they've practiced uh, and when they got their rifle, some of them are getting them two weeks before the season starts. And so that's just not enough time to, to practice and to, that's not even time to get it on paper at 100 yards nicely yeah. to make sure that you got a nice hole that's 
you know, within two inch within a two inch diameter of the of the of the bullseye. Yeah. I mean, Another question about using LPVO while hunting. Do you even know what that stands for? LPVO, I think, is the scope that you use on an AR-15. Okay. One to four power. Um, you can use some. I mean, but what are you, you know, what rifle are you going to use it with? You use it with an AR? Is hunting with a 22 ethical? Unless you're shooting, maybe you're shooting a 300 blackout. But I have a 300 blackout, and I can tell you, I wouldn't shoot any animal past 100 yards with that darn thing. Yeah. Because it's not very accurate. It's it's basically a, a 30 caliber with no powder behind it. So, yeah, you know, I think you, you bring you, up a good point, Rick, is it could be legal, but it may not be ethical. Correct. And my my thing with hunting is I do not want to ever, ever injure or wound an animal. Yeah. And the more chances you take and the less, most of us do not. I'll give you an example of somebody that can shoot long distance. It happens to be my nephew in Colorado. And I've seen him take an elk at a thousand yards, but he shoots every week. He's a competitor in the, uh, in the precision rifle series and the NRL series. He shoots every week all the time. He just burned out a barrel with 2000 rounds in it. In two years, that guy can shoot. But I right. would tell you right now, most of us do not spend the time and energy to be able to take an animal past 200 even. Yeah. How about, uh, can you touch on MOA dot size? What are your thoughts on that? MOA dot size? Yes. Yeah, that, I, it, not a pure dot, but a crosshair with MOA dots in it. Great. Just remember that most of them second plane, second focal plane. If you can use those MOAs for something, make sure that you're on full power on your scope because that most scopes will tell you where those MOAs are accurate. Right. So, so a question about just your personal recommendation. There's, a, there's an MOA. There's an MOA crosshair right there on the screen. Got it. So that's what a typical either straight crosshair or something that looks like this is a hunting reticle. Yeah. And just what would you recommend as far as like a new hunter? Uh, would you recommend them getting a like cap turret or open the open turret that you can adjust without opening the cap? Anything that has an open turret or well let's put that that's not true anymore you don't need an open turret for hunting because you're never going to dial the darn thing mm. you're never going to go out there and change your elevation to hunt you're generally going to and we talk about it later in in the presentation about when we're sighting in but many people sight their rifles in at 200 you're at 200 you're going to hit anything within a four inch four inch diameter out to 300 yards you're going to hit that four inch circle Mm -hmm. that's good enough but yeah. in the past 200 i man i've shot an animal at 400 and it was a hope and a prayer with a with a big rifle so let's see looking at the chat now and so this person has having a difficult time getting a full view from your scope and oh. he keeps on having to reposition yeah. for the proper view what's he doing wrong uh his 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 distance from his eye to the scope is wrong so he has to undo his scope mounts and and change the the position of the scope to his eye off his cheek well and that's a good segue to part two of this webinar series because we're going to be talking how to mount a scope in the next webinar that you're doing, correct? Right, right. And we're gonna talk about how to mount a scope. Part of how to mount a scope is getting the correct eye to, eye to, uh, to um, ocular lens distance. Your, you know, your eye clearance for, to your thing, to your, uh, to your scope from the, from the stock. So let's talk about long range. So some of the, some of the people have asked about long range stuff and they have interest in it. Um, 
generally your long range rifle is going to be completely different than your because most long range shooters are now shooting six millimeter a deer maybe maybe pig that's okay but they're shooting they're shooting 243 bullet because they don't want any recoil coil because they, they want to see where the stri bullet strikes and so they're shooting small small caliber bullets they're not shooting 30 caliber bullets in competition. So you're probably going to have a little different rifle for competition. Um, long range, more magnification, better. I, this one, this, this scope I have here is a 20 power scope, but I, most of my other rifles are 30 power scope. They all have parallax adjustment because you're going to be out six, 700 yards, 800 yards. Good luck finding a range, but, uh, but you're going to have parallax adjustment on it. <clears throat> Largest tube you can afford or are willing to carry because those tubes get heavy. Um, Horace or crisp material, which I have one on the on uh, the next slide is actually a Horace reticle. Um, uh, MRAD or mill that you'll see you'll see on scope descriptions that they'll talk about MRAD or mill. They're the same, but the, but and it's very MRAD and mill are very popular right now. So it depends on what your fashion, how much you're willing to pay for your fashion statement, or MOA is fine because most cheap scopes are MOA. And one of the most common things in long distance is to to make your scope point up a little bit, and that's a twenty. They they call them twenty MOA rails. That the rail is pointed up twenty MOA because you're not going to use the bottom part of the adjustment of the scope, or the under the underside of the elevation of the scope. You're only going to want to go higher. So everybody starts at, uh, their scopes tilted a little bit up uphill downrange, so that they so that they can they can do, have more elevation up, and so the come very common to have twenty MOA uh, scope rails on on uh, on uh, uh, scopes. That's a Horace reticle, or what I was calling a Christmas tree. You can tell why it's called a Christmas tree, and thirty percent of the screen is filled with numbers. So you have to kind of know what the numbers mean and why you want to use it, all that stuff. But that's what a long range scope is. Do you need that for hunting? Not a chance. Cro straight crosshairs will work fine. Or the BDC reticle that I showed before with MOA is fine. Take out your phones. Here's some um, kind of ideas or uh, reference re, uh, resources that you can use that I don't think we all need to know or have, but uh, but uh, the first one, Ryan Kleckner was one of the first speakers about first and second focal plane. He happens to be attorney in Phoenix, but he's a former um, Army Ranger sniper instructor. So he's a good he's and he the if you don't know who the National Shooting Sports Foundation is, they're the Retailers Association for the shooting industry. And he is their spokesperson for long distance shooting. That's why I use him. He's really good. And the other video I used was Vortex. Vortex is a is a uh, reputable source of information, but Kleckner's always good. But Kleckner has a YouTube channel with tons of stuff about shooting rifles. Tons of stuff. This is his YouTube channel. Uh, X-Ring is another one I like. Um, he's a, I think he's a former police sniper, but he's a, he, comp, he shoots competition rifle. A Cosmic Richard Rifle series of all different kinds. He reviews, a t I think he makes his total living on doing YouTube videos because he puts one out every week. But um, but uh, his information is good. His stuff is solid. He is, he, uh, his, I think his name is Ray Brown, but he's a guy in Virginia and he does a really good job talking about rifle shooting and long distance rifle shooting. Um. This is one that's kind of interesting. This company called Natchez out of Natchez, Kentucky, I think it is. They sell reconditioned scopes. So you, you're, you're not buying a scope that's brand new. Somebody had it, it broke or something was wrong with it or it's scratched. But you can get a 20, 30 percent discount on virtually a brand new scope. And the reconditioned scopes have a new new scope warranty. And they have lots of scopes on this side. I think there were like 30 scopes on there when I looked at it. And they're all good companies. Like uh, I know they do. Um, I know they 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 stock uh, Nikon scopes, and uh, Nikon's are big big company. They used to do Redding. They don't do Redding anymore because they got bought out. Um, but anyway, they have a lot of scopes on there, and they're reconditioned. They're a real deal. 
I bought scopes off of there. Whoa, this is awesome. 20% off, I'll take it. Uh, this is a meat eater article about what a rifle show. If you ever know who meat eater is, he's, it's, it's a company out of Montana that does hunting videos called meat eater. And, um, this was, this was a, what a rifle scope sh should I choose? It was a great uh, video about or article about how to buy a rifle scope for hunting, not for long distance shooting. And here's my last comment. Don't spend less than a hundred dollars on the scope, maybe 200. There's, there's just not a lot. I mean, it, it costs a hundred dollars to go out to dinner almost anymore. So, you know, a hundred dollars on a rifle scope isn't much. So yeah. I would spend more than two hundred dollars on a rifle scope if I were anybody out there listening. You can get you can get scopes that'll work below below two hundred. But remember, uh, I think I explained it with when Eric and I were doing the uh, the the um, the pre check on this on this on this talk that think about this: if you buy a scope at two hundred and you buy a scope at four hundred you're probably getting twice the value for your scope. If you're debating between a $1,000 scope and a $1,500 scope or $2,000 scope, you're not gonna get that big a, an improvement over your scope. If you're gonna talk about from a $2,000 scope to a $6,000 scope, let me tell you, there ain't a hell of a lot of difference, but it costs more. So when you spend money, think about how you spend money. If you only have, if you, can barely get two hundred dollars to buy a rifle scope. If you buy a hundred dollar rifle scope, how much better is the two hundred dollar rifle scope going to be? It's going to be leaps and bounds better, just because of at the price point where things where things happen. As you get to the higher end, it costs way more to get small increments of 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 quality increase. So, the question's coming in, Rick, on our fixed bow. Power scopes a good option for hunting? I, I guess that would probably be dependent upon terrain, wouldn't it? Terrain, game, distance. Uh, fixed power scopes tend to be used in the East Coast because there's hunting in deep forest, and they're generally their shots are less than 100 yards. But out here, we tend to use more. Four would be probably a little low. I'd probably look at eight or ten if I was going to look at a fixed power scope. And then there aren't a lot of fixed power scopes left. Is the other thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, fixed power scopes are a rare breed anymore. Most of them are 4X. And I don't know in the West if I, I would hunt with a 4X scope. It's just a little under underarmed. Yeah. So here's a question on, are there any tricks to fix, a, to fix open turrets to make sure they're not rotated accidentally during the hunt? And I personally have had that issue <laughs> with uh, people not, uh, turning their turrets back to to zero and turning them the wrong way, so they're shooting way high. Um, any suggestions on that, Rick? Other than like well, the zero number one, speed? don't don't turn your turrets in, in when you're hunting. Number one, <laughs> number two, <laughs> number two. When you buy a hunting scope, make sure or a scope, make sure that the clicks, if it's an externally adjustable one, make sure the clicks are really tough to do. Not mm. tough, but they're definitive in other words they can't yeah. be bumped. like this scope here to change the elevation you have to push a button and this and the windage scope the windage on this scope is actually covered it's an open it's an open turret but you have to uncover it so yeah the scope company and what you do most of my scopes are pretty it's not hard to make them click but boy it's sure a definitive click when i do it and you can count it's because you can count them when you do it that's why you want the definitive clicks and they don't move. Yeah. So let's just talk kind of rubber meets the team scopes. Unfortunately, their clicks are not real good mm -hmm. and they, when you bump them and stuff. So I guess that would be an advantage to actually going into a sporting goods store and actually handling a scope prior to purchasing. Or the other one is I look, I look at line and other people's reviews and a lot of people say, oh, this one's mushy. If they say the clicks are mushy, don't buy it. Yeah. That's that's just kind of a, you, you just kind of look at it and go, oh, that's not a good, that's not a good feature. So I, I want definitive clicks in my scopes. And that will okay. keep them from being bumped. 
Yeah. How about now, uh, now I will I will tell a horror story. I was elk hunting in Colorado and I didn't sight in my rifle when I got there. I sighted it in the week before the range. I was on dead on. It was a 110 yard shot with a with a range finder. And it was a six by seven elk. I missed it because my scope got bumped. Hmm. When we went back to the hundred yard range to sight it to see if it would happen, it was a it was a foot high. Wow. More than a foot high. It went right over its back. So, you know, the, it, stuff happens. Yeah. So. So I think that's that's a valid point. If you if you do bump your scope, if you do know that you it, your whole rifle has had impact, we've had that happen. We actually had that happen on a sheep hunt. And um, it was kind of like, well, do you continue to use that rifle or do you take it out of commission and spend a couple hours to make it making sure that rifle's still dialed in and either I, one make sure yeah. it's dialed in or don't use it but yeah. I'll, I'll tell you another one is is that um most of these scopes are marked and the, if you have a zero stop rifle your zero stop set if you if you bump it you know it's good at 100 yeah or you can read and see the numbers that they've been bumped that you can change the turret so that wherever you dial it in on 100, you can turn the turret to zero. So that's your zero point. So you know that's zero. If you can see if you can see the zeros move, you got a problem. So that's yeah. another way to kind of think about the, the bumping of scope while hunting. And Rick, you're not a salesperson for any of these companies, but a, a question did come in, and I think it's a good and valid question about uh, preferences, warranties glass clarity are there companies talk to us about maybe some of the companies that that uh have good warranties and companies that you would recommend well one company i will tell you has, has a great warranty is vortex vortex i've had warranties with i've actually had a vortex scope that i broke twice and they finally sent me back my money that's how good mm -hmm. they were they just said it's not going to work. This it was it was a fifteen hundred dollars scope, and they said no, it's not going to work for you. Okay, fine. They sent me back my money, what I paid for it. I was impressed. Incredible. Yeah. Um, but lifetime warranties are critical. Make sure those companies will back their lifetime warranties. Mm -hmm. I've seen well, there was a scope company that was doing. They were doing a tour of a scope company factory. I won't say who it is, but they had warrant. They had scopes that they had warranty, and I went. Whoa, that one got run over by a car. They warranted it. That one got dropped off a mountain. They warranted it. So some of these scope companies are amazing on warranty. Most of them are pretty good if they have a lifetime warranty. If you're buying Chinese, the really cheap Chinese stuff, good luck. Because it's not, it's it, it they don't have, a lot of them don't have warranties. Uh, now, mm -hmm. the kind of the lens, they're asking about lens quality, right, Eric? Correct. So, so there is there is this thing about um uh i think it's called esp glass stuff from japan most of those scopes are you'll hear about it and most of those scopes are oh i think they usually start about 1500 to 3000 dollars those are japanese scope the with the the extra extra cl clear clear glass if you have the money, great. If you don't have the money, believe me, a two hundred dollars scope you can go hunt with, easy. So don't think that you have to buy the very best to get your job accomplished. Because hunting is not long distance shooting. Long distance. If you're going to go long distance shooting, whole another animal, whole another animal. Yeah. I mean, I took a Schmidt Bender scope, the five six thousand dollars scope at the shot show last year, and I picked it up. And, Whoa, now I know why they pay six grand for these things. But I'm not spending six grand on a rifle scope. So, you know, it's it it's a it's a it's a catch twenty two. You have to balance what you do with the money that you have to spend. Yeah. Uh, I, will say, I will mention one company. I don't work for them, I don't sell their product. But if you want to do long distance shooting, the new hot ticket right now, they're they're um their aberration is a little high. Their color correction isn't perfect, 
but they're selling great rifle scopes in the five, six, four, between $400 and $600. And it's called Arken, A R K E N. Hmm. But they're long distance scopes. They're mill. They've got all the horse reticles in them. They're, it's got all the features I was talking about for long distance shooting. They're primary long distance shooting. But man, for long distance shooting, they're an incredible bargain for the money. Yeah. Right now, it's hard to get them because they're so popular. Interesting. And and I compare them with some of my $2,000 scopes. So we've got a question about matching the scope to the caliber of rifle. And this the question specifically talks about the ability to handle recoil. Is that is that an issue in your opinion, Rick? Not with most hunting rounds. Yeah. Maybe 50 BMG or 338 Lapua, but for anything i mean i can't think of anybody in california shooting bigger than a 300 wind mag or yeah and and i'll tell you the rival scope that i broke from with vortex i broke with a 338 lapua interesting Rachel. that's why they gave me my money back um but i would just want to thank you so much rick for your your willingness to come on and talk with us and uh share your experiences and information um is super valuable and i want to thank everybody for for attending and i just also want to give kind of a shameless plug for the advanced hunter ed education program there's a qr code that you can see uh off to my i think it's off to my left hand side and you can click on that and you'll be able to see a bunch of clinics and webinars that we've got lined out in 2024 we've got some really fun ones some fun ones that i'm looking forward to on the 23rd of this month, we're doing a big horn sheeting webinar, and uh, we're going to be doing a bunch of backcountry clinics, um, in-person clinics. We're going to be actually addressing some of the stuff that we've, we've been talking about on this webinar about long-range rifle hunting and the ethics behind it. We're going to have a whole clinic about that. We're going to be doing beginner and advanced archery clinics, and then a lot of the more traditional uh, hunter education clinics as well, like deer, turkey, waterfowl. So anyway, we've got a bunch in the works. And if you can't tell already, I'm super pumped about this job and this opportunity. And that being said, Rick, I want to thank you so much again for your time. Thanks for everybody that stuck with us and, and joined with us throughout all the webinar.